We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Michael Pento from Pento Portfolio Strategies. How are you today, Michael? I'm doing fine, Tom. Thanks for asking. Glad to have you back. So you have a 20-point inflation-deflation economic cycle model that, as you said, isn't quite flashing red yet, only amber. So I'd like to get your thoughts on you know, some of the factors that you look at there and what would change it to red for you. Okay, so it's a 20-point mo- Thank you for having me on the program again, too. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So it's a 20-point model, and it's predicated on the second derivative of growth and inflation. Basically, what I want to do is try to divine where the economy is headed in a direction of either accelerating growth or decelerating growth, or inflating or disinflating or deflating. And if you can determine that, you can determine where your money is best placed. I mean, it makes sense. If you're in a situation where the economy, and I'm talking about the G3 economies, so if the global economy is accelerating and the rate of inflation is accelerating, then you're probably not well served in bond and bond proxies. It makes sense, correct? Mm -hmm. And if the economy is decelerating and disinflating or deflating or headed for a depression, then you probably want to own more of the bond and bond proxies. And you probably want to take some other precautions like going long the dollar or raising some cash. And this way is a complicated 20-point model, but the basic premise is you want to ride these asset bubbles higher when it's appropriate, but also be able to protect and profit from these resets, from these crashes, which are becoming more violent and more frequent over time, simply because the entire global economy, the entire developed world economy is predicated on interest rate manipulation and asset bubbles and debt. Mm -hmm. And when you predicate a global economy on that, it's just built on sand. And when the tide, you know, comes in and the storms and the torrents fall, it washes away the foundation. And this is exactly what's happening. So it's all based on central bank manipulation of markets. Mm -hmm. So right now, the model is flashing amber because we are not disinflating, we are not deflating, and we are not recessing. So normally you would think, well, when would I want to be more cautious? When would the IDEC portfolio, the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle portfolio, want to get into that more protective stance during times of recession, depression, deflation? Well, we're not there at all. So why were we flashing amber, especially when we are growing and accelerating on that second derivative basis. The only reason why that would occur is if you had a shock in the bond market. If the spiking bond yields, which you're seeing across the entire globe right now, lead to chaos in the credit markets. Now, as of this moment, they are not yet there. The chaos caused in markets so far, which my model picked up on, was going to be most saliently felt in the NASDAQ high-flying tech stocks. So basically, you think about the reopening of the global economy, which we are in the middle of right now, it was going to be very detrimental to those stay-at-home stocks. Think about the high-flying stocks like, say, Peloton or Zoom. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those stocks, those NASDAQ stocks, are held in ETFs that also own the Apples and the Googles and the Amazon, which everybody was sequestered in during this pandemic. So it made sense to get out of those high-flying stocks. Some of them, by the way, are down 40%. 4-0, I didn't misspeak. 40% in a matter of a few weeks, Tom. So, you know, if you were like me and you went into banks and you went into other assets that benefit when the yield curve widens and when nominal rates increase, then you're far better off, much better off than being in, you know, the Pelotons of the world. But just to wrap up your question, when you see this spike in bond yields start to disrupt the credit markets, then it's time to start heading into a much more defensive position in the portfolio. So three factors that you're really watching right now that you were talking about was growth is basically very subdued right now. Inflation needs to be quiescent and a Fed that's buying heavily on the long end of the curve. 
These are all conditions that are present right now. And we've had basically these conditions present since 2000. So is there any room for the Fed to step in and pull any lever to bring the market back from a crash? Well, first of all, what I'm saying is I don't agree with that premise because I, uh, what you need to have bond yields to be quiescent is you need to have subdued growth, subdued inflation, and the Fed at the helm trying to manipulate interest rates. We've had that mm -hmm. before, but now what you're seeing as the economy starts to slowly reopen, and I, by the way, I don't know how long this is going to last. I really don't know. I mean, I don't know if the warmer weather and the vaccinations are bringing a temporary healing to the economy. The economy reopens. You see massive hiring, especially in the leisure and hospitality sector, and interest rates spike, but then it all unravels in the fall. I mean, that's my base case scenario, by the way. You know, look what's going on in the government. The government in the United States, we just borrowed $4 trillion last year in a quote unquote fiscal stimulus. And we're in the process of, if the House approves this on Tuesday, we're going to have, and it'll be signed by Biden shortly after, we'll have $1.9 trillion in relief for COVID relief. So you're talking about the baseline deficit for 2021 was, I think it was $2.3 trillion. And then you add to that the COVID relief package, $1.9 trillion, and then rate spiking I mean, you could have a deficit that's 35% of GDP. <laughs> I mean, talk about massive stimulus. So right now, yes, the Fed is at the helm. The Fed is manipulating markets. So you have that. But you're losing that quiescence, the lack of problems in inflation and growth. I mean, we do have accelerating growth now. You're going to have GDP growth close to 7%. In Q2, because it's just based on base effects, Tom. Mm -hmm. You know, last year you had deflation and a plunging economy globally. So the base effects, the year over year change in growth and inflation is going to be surging in the second quarter. So you don't have that quiescence in those two factors. All you have left is the Fed, but you have a multi trillion dollar government stimulus plan most of which is going to be monetized by the Fed. The Fed is monetizing debt at $1.44 trillion in annual QE. Like I said, you can have booming non-farm payroll reports, huge increases in leisure hospitality sector hiring. Mm -hmm. And then this is going to cause the bond market to start anticipating the end of QE. That's short-term bearish for bond prices and very bullish for bond yields. Mm -hmm. The salient question is, when does that spill over into credit markets? So far, the answer is not yet. <laughs> but a wise investor is watching it. Because how many more times in your investing career do you want to lose half of your money? You did it in 2000, you did it in 2008, you lost 30% in 2018 in the Russell, then you lost 30% in a few weeks in 2020. I mean, how many times can this happen? And Tom, if we have another problem in the credit markets today or in the very near future, the wiggle room to ameliorate that condition is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, the Fed is not going to be able to cut rates. What central bank on the planet is going to be able to aggressively cut interest rates? They're all pretty much at zero. And what central bank on the planet is going to be able to mollify a condition of rising inflation by promising to cap yields by printing more money? These are the questions that I'm asking to make sure my investors, or at least the goal is to always increase your purchasing power and your standard of living, no matter what the cycle is. Absolutely. So as we're talking about that, Michael, what is the particular problem in today's economy that hasn't been a problem for an entire generation that, as Annie Lowry puts it, just because <laughs> most people don't have a memory of it? <laughs> you know, I was watching, and the reason why I put that, I wrote a commentary about this called... Um, the bond market rocks the Richter scale. And I was watching Fareed Zakaria. He's on CNN, GPS, Global Public Square. And he had Annie Lowry on. And she wrote this book, you know, espousing universal basic income and monetary theory, which is just basically the philosophy that, hey, we don't have to worry about debt and deficits. We have this tool called the printing press. So we don't have to borrow money from the private sector ever. We just print it with a lack of harm, you know, innocuously. And her premise, and I was you know, astutely listening attentively of her rationale, looking for some intelligent rationale from this woman. And, and she said, well, inflation hasn't been a problem for a generation, so hence it's not a problem. What kind of logic is that? You know, would you stand on top of a dormant volcano that has a history of blowing up every 20 years and 
on the 21st year, stand on top of it and make your home and build a home there because it hasn't been a problem for a generation. No, you know that this problem is going to resurface. It's an economic fact that inflation hasn't been eradicated from the economic cycle. Mm -hmm. And what is the progenitor of inflation? It's a booming money supply that's not just sequestered around the canyons of Wall Street. It's when the private sector gets its hands on central bank debt monetization. And that's precisely what's happening with universal basic income. And that's what Annie Lowry espouses. So what I'm saying is, you know, you've had intractable inflation in asset prices. Look at home price to income ratios. They're back to where they were in 2005 at the peak of the housing bubble. Look what's happening in the stock market. You have asset prices today which are miles higher than they were in 2000 and in 2007, and then even in 1929. All-time record market cap to GDP ratio. Mm -hmm. So that intractable inflation is going to start to spill over to the consumer price inflation. And why that will happen is because you are bypassing the banking system. You are printing money and handing it directly to people, not just big banks. And that is how you're going to get a broader expansion in the monetary aggregates. You're going to get velocity of money to increase, and you will get your inflation. You know, here's what really bothers me, Tom. It really bothers me that the central bank portrays itself as this master of interest rates. But they can pick inflation targets and hit them you know, spot on, stick the landing. Well, when has that ever been the case, Tom? You know, the Fed has been trying to generate a two, two and a half percent inflation rate since the financial crisis, since the Great Recession of 2008. And for most of that time, it was unable to achieve it. And if you think back to the 70s, the Fed never wanted inflation to run at 15 percent per annum rates in the United States. That's exactly what they got because they cannot accurately control inflation and hence they cannot accurately control the bond market. It's very, very difficult. Inflation is not about the number of people working. It's not about what Mr. Powell or whoever, whatever central banker thinks inflation should be. It's the market's perception of the purchasing power of its fiat currency. And when you destroy that faith in that currency, inflation can go from 1% to 20% to 200% to 2 million percent. You just don't have control over it. And I don't believe that Mr. Powell, if he gets his 2% inflation, I don't believe it's going to stop there. And I don't think he can actually shut it off. And I don't think he can do it innocuously. In other words, if he decides to stop printing money, the crash in asset prices will be absolutely devastating. And you will get a period of depression in this country like we've never seen before, because you're just crashing from much higher levels. So what does Mr. Powell do? Does he try to cap long-term interest rates by printing money, by monetizing the long end of the yield curve? Well, let's see if you can stop an inflation problem by creating more inflation. I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. So exactly as you're saying there, Michael, from your perspective, how far do you think we are from seeing some type of yield curve control? Well, it's all about your perception and definition. So the Fed is already controlling yields. It's not just the Fed, by the way. I'm talking about the Bank of Canada. I'm talking about you know the Bank of Australia. I'm talking about the ECB, the BOJ, the PBOC. All of the banks are controlling yields, yield curve control, because they're printing $120 billion a month to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when they talk about yield curve control, what they really mean is, hey, central banker, when are you going to stop yields from rising? They have a huge problem with bond yields in Europe. You know, you look at the Italian 10 year now, I think it's at 0.72 basis points, rising rapidly. I mean, do the Italians want to have their bond yields continue to rise like this in a country that's saturated in debt the way they are? I mean, no, the answer is no. So, yield curve control, what you really are asking is when will Jerome Powell and the rest of the central bankers try to put a cap, a hard cap, and say, listen, the 10-year note will not go past 2%. That would be the case here in the United States. And that will happen when you see problems in the credit markets. I come back to the same thing. It is crucial. 
watch LIBOR OIS, watch high yield spreads to treasuries, watch all the other spreads that I look at. And then you'll determine when they're going to start to deploy things like yield curve control. But I'll tell you one thing, if Mr. Powell deploys yield curve control, it'll be because the credit markets blow up and because the stock market crashes in arrears. He'll do this in reaction to devastation in markets. So, Michael, as you were talking about 2005 being the top of the housing bubble, Mm -hmm. how many more bubbles have we added since then? Well, you know, back in 2005, which was the peak of the housing bubble, it didn't really crash until 2008, but it started to roll over back then. That was the primary concern that we had. We had an international real estate bubble, but we really didn't have a bond bubble at that time. I mean, the Fed funds rate was five and a quarter percent in 2006. And we didn't have really a stock market bubble. The total market cap to GDP was around 100%. Now it's 190%, the total market cap to GDP. Actually, it was at 195% before this latest sell-off. So you have record, you don't just have a record housing bubble, you have a record stock bubble on top of a record bond bubble. I mean, back in the lead up to the Great Recession and the housing crisis, we didn't ever think We didn't even imagine there could be such a thing as a negative yielding sovereign bond. Well, there's $15 trillion worth of those things out there in the world. There's even negative yielding junk debt, Tom. So the fact that you have to pay somebody, you know, you're paying someone to lend them your money. That was inconceivable back then. So you have an epic bond bubble, an incredible housing bubble, and a record stock bubble, all three existing concurrently. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Michael, can you explain for us how the situation with GameStop shows just how fragile the system really is? Well, Tom, you know, you think about all the trillions of dollars in, let's just look at junk bonds, CLOs, and triple B debt, which is really the riskiest part of corporate credit. You're talking about $6 trillion, over $6 trillion. That's a lot of money that I think is in danger of collapsing if we have another credit crisis, which the way these yields are headed, we're very likely to have one. But GameStop, what was the market cap of GameStop? A couple of billion dollars? It was just a few billion. It was nothing. So GameStop, and this is not my opinion. This is Thomas Petterfee of Interactive Brokers. He's the CEO of that company. He said, we are very close to having the whole system shut down, the whole financial system shut down because of a couple of minor issues. You know, GameStop was the movie theater chain. I think it was AMC. A couple of these stocks that really are worthless compared to the multiple trillion dollars in just the bond market. I didn't even consider what the housing market or the stock market could do. So here's the point, which I think you're asking. If GameStop could almost bring down the financial system, according to Thomas Betterfee, not Michael Pento, what is going to be the collapse of the credit markets and the corporate bond market, the sovereign debt market, the housing market, and the real estate market? What is that going to do? So we have a very fragile financial system right now, for sure. Mm -hmm. So Michael, you shared with me that you're not currently bullish on gold. So what factors are you looking for that would change your mind on that? So I consider myself a gold bug. I love gold. It's absolutely historically proven the best placeholder for your wealth. In other words, you you can put money in gold and you'll never lose your purchasing power. So I always start with 5% of your net worth in physical gold. That is what you should have in your possession. So let's just take that off the table. I didn't change my mind about that. But then because I run an RIA, registered investment advisory firm, I toggle the allocation between zero and 20% Mm -hmm. of the allocation to gold and gold miners. And last time I was on your program, I think it was like 10 months ago, I was wildly bullish on gold. And now I have zero. I have no gold in the portfolio, no miners and no physical gold in the portfolio. And the reason is because the model is very clear on this. The back testing is very clear. You don't want to own gold during times of rising real interest rates when nominal rates are rising faster than the rate of inflation. And if you can understand that, you can save yourself a lot of angst, especially when you talk about gold miners and the very volatile sector of not only just gold, but even you know silver and the other you know ancillary precious metals. That's it. If you understand that, 
you will understand when you should overweight gold and when you should underweight gold in your investment portfolio. I'm not talking about the gold you're going to give to your grandchildren, the heirlooms, the legacies that you give your family after you pass on. That's something that's out of the question here. I'm just talking about your investment part. And, you know, I was on record saying this. This is not, I'm saying this, saying this today in arrears after, you know, it collapsed. I sold all of my miners in the fall of 2020, went on record talking about it and why I was doing it. I called it the vaccine dead zone, that this period of vaccine approval would cause real interest rates to start rising. Mm -hmm. And then I sold all of my physical gold in the portfolio about a month ago for precisely the same reason. Remember, miners are a leverage play on the physical metal. Right. And this is what the portfolio is telling me. This is the inflation deflation cycle model is telling me that could happen later this year is you'll see the second derivative of growth in inflation fall precipitously around September. And that would be a wonderful opportunity to get back into physical precious metals in the portfolio. And I think it's going to happen because you know, you're going to face later this year a fiscal and monetary cliff like we have never seen before. Don't forget, you know, this growth that I'm talking about is all artificial. Please don't get me wrong. This is not a viable economy. This is economy built, has its foundation on sand. Mm -hmm. So when you get that fiscal cliff, in other words, we are not going to have multiple trillion dollar fiscal stimulus packages forever. There'll be times when they end and they will end in the fall. After Mr. Biden passes his 1.9 trillion COVID package, he might come back on the heels of that with an infrastructure package of a few trillion dollars spread out over a decade. But there'll be no, you know, fourteen hundred dollar checks mailed to every person in America, practically. That's not gonna happen any longer. And then as these interest rates continue to rise, you're gonna see the end, or at least Wall Street will begin to price in the end of $120 billion, $1.44 trillion a month, $1.44 trillion a year of Fed stimulus, of central bank debt monetization. So you're going to have a fiscal and monetary cliff, which I think could be very, very dangerous for the stock market at these levels. So that probably will be a wonderful time to get back into gold in your investment portfolio, say late summer, early fall. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, you were saying you toggle between zero to 20% gold in mm-hmm. your portfolio. What else do you hold in this environment? Right now, I have banks holding my nose and uh, you know anything basically that would increase in price when the yield curve increases. So you think about the short-term rates pegged at around zero and the 10-year note heading towards 2%. So anything that would benefit. So you think about banks, you think about a quadratic IVOL portfolio that I have. You think about shorting the bond market, the long end of the bond market, which I have done. I also sold all of my foreign exposure, but I do have still some BHB built-in in the portfolio. I have some exposure to an ETF that would benefit from any kind of infrastructure that's passed in the United States. I think you're going to get that passed probably in the late spring, early summer time frame. So basically anything that takes advantage of an expanding yield curve is what I'm in right now. And that's, you know... Oh, also, by the way, I'll add this too. This is something I very rarely do, but I actually went long the dollar about a week ago too. Interesting. Just as a hedge in the portfolio, because here's the fact. Listen, I'm a gold bug. I think the dollar's going down in a secular basis. But this is the truth. When you have a period of global angst, when you have a condition where there's a credit crisis or any kind of crisis globally in the financial sector, what do people do? they rush into the dollar. Mm -hmm. It's been proven over and over again. So it's not about me speaking dogmatically about what's going to happen someday 10 years from now. I don't care about that. It's what is the best odds of making money right now and in the immediate future. And right now, the dollar is doing very well for us. This is why. Because you're seeing growth rates in the United States higher than they are in its trading partners, And you're seeing interest rates rise at a faster pace than they are outside the United States. That is the recipe for a rising dollar. I don't think it's going to last long. If you're not in a hedge fund, you know, structure the way I trade, then I wouldn't bother even looking at it. But if you wanted to make money in the short run, that's a great place to be. So that's the portfolio right now, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your uh, non-dogmatic view (laughs) 
and you telling us, you know, why mm -hmm. exactly you're not bullish gold right now. But as we're mm -hmm. talking about, let's just call them these alternative assets. I wanted to ask you how threatened central governments are by cryptocurrencies. You know, I already alienated all the gold bugs. Now I'm going to alienate all the, <laughs> all the cryptocurrency bugs. So I probably won't be a very popular interview for your audience. But I just want to say this, that I think that governments are working now with these private cryptocurrencies because they want people to get used to using or conducting commerce without physical cash. This is my theory. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do think that someday you're going to see, I've been saying this now for, I guess, four or five years, that you'll eventually see governments deploy their own blockchain-based currencies. So you have like a Fed coin or an ECB coin, and they will outlaw all private currencies, all private cryptocurrencies, all private blockchains. That's one of the main reasons why I don't think that Bitcoin is a good investment. I mean, you can't outlaw the actual blockchain it's very difficult to do that. I understand that. But if you take Wall Street out of Bitcoin, what's the price? If you say Coinbase is illegal and conducting commerce using cryptocurrencies is illegal or downloading a wallet, which you need to do, you need to download a digital wallet to get access to a Bitcoin or to conduct commerce in it, what does that do to the value? I think it crushes the value of Bitcoin. So I'm very afraid of that. It's one of the main reasons why. But I think governments right now, to answer your question, are happy. They, they treat this with alacrity. Hey, people can get used to transacting on a blockchain, on a virtual currency, and that means that they won't balk at me coming in later and adopting a Fed coin and then telling you, well, hey, your interest rates now aren't zero. They're now negative five. <laughs> and in that way, they can control the inflation very easily. I mean, you think about the inflation they would get if they told you you could either keep your money in the bank or lose 5% of it. <laughs> you, you'd probably be inclined to spend what you had very quickly, right? And that's what they, you know, they get the velocity going, money supply booming, and you get any inflation you want. So that's what my fear is. But even if that doesn't happen, basically what I'm saying is that Bitcoin at $50,000 a unit is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like, you know, a, a mad scientist's experiment and mm -hmm. we can all kind of assume what the outcome is, correct? Well, I mean, I don't know the purpose for it. I mean, the purpose is supposed to be an alternative currency, but I mean, it doesn't have the bandwidth to ever, you know, match what a credit card company could do. I think there's only five transactions per second that can be allowed on the Bitcoin network. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to conduct those transactions. So I don't think it'll ever be a currency that supplants fiat. So that'll never happen. Governments will never allow their currencies to be usurped without a fight. They don't want to lose control of their currencies. So that'll never happen. And one more reason, not that you need another one, but what's the one single function that they all supply is they all conduct these transactions anonymously, right? It's also immutably and um, indestructibly, but it's the fact that you're anonymous when you make these transactions. Well, you know, governments don't really like money laundering and firms like mine are subject to know your customer laws. Well, I mean, the Bitcoin says, well, hey, here, I'll give you my name and my personal information so you can track who I am. <laughs> well, if that's the case, you know, not a very good currency, and you can track who I am, you know, well, what's the purpose of it? But here's the bigger point. I'll leave you with this. This is the last thing I'll say about it. Every single blockchain performs that function. You can do a transaction anonymously, immutably. And if they all perform the same function, then how rare are they really? Not very rare at all. I mean, they, they, it's almost as if I said to you, you know, the scientists were finding new elements in the Earth's crust that were very similar to gold. And they were indestructible and very limited in supply and beautiful and, you know, rare. I mean, it, it dilutes every existing Bitcoin that's out there every time you create another cryptocurrency because they all perform the same function. So it's not gold 2.0 and it never will be. Excellent, Michael. Do you have any concluding thoughts as we wrap up here? Well, I think my concluding thought would be that the swings between inflation and deflation are going to become more intense and with greater frequency over time. So if I can leave you with anything, it doesn't have to be pent-up portfolio strategies. 
you should be with an active manager. Do not passively invest in the stock market with this balanced portfolio of you know stocks and bonds because both are in a bubble. And if you invest that way, the chances are that you are subject to dramatic downturns in your purchasing power and significant crashes in the value of your principal over periods of these cycles where you see deflation cycles wipe out you know, 50% of your value, then the Fed comes back in and central banks come back and then they monetize everything, they make everything right, then you reinflate these asset bubbles and they crash again. That's going to be the modus operandi going forward. And you should try to model that and take advantage of it rather than being a victim of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent, Michael. Well, of course, we can find more of your information at pentoport.com. Anywhere else you'd like our audience to find you? You can email me at mpento at pentoport.com. And the website, as you said, is pentoport.com. And be happy to field your phone call here. One of the assistants here will pick your phone up if you call the office at 732-772-9500 here in the States. If you have around $100,000 to invest and you are a U.S. citizen, we'll take good care of you. Excellent, Michael. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.